Okay, so we're going to open this up to questions from the audience. Um, I took two pages of notes, so I won't even start with my questions. Um, we don't have a movable microphone, so just so that everyone can hear you if you have a question, uh, please stand up and project. Um, we are recording, so we want to try to make sure we can hear everybody. Okay, and you want to start? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I think this really interesting talks. Um, yeah, it was the first time I've heard you talk, uh, give a full wrap of your tolerance um, project, and uh, it gave me some, it, it, it sparked some thoughts about tolerance in a new way for me, and it was particularly two things that you said. One was about um, it not demanding anything of allies, really, and the other was the thing you said in the opening about tolerance always being, uh, suggesting a negative, that you, you only tolerate things that are, you know, implicitly uh, a negative. And um, and I guess I the thing I was wondering is it, whether there's a way to expect to demand more or expect more of allies by conceptualizing tolerance. I, I'm thinking a little more psychoanalytically, but I'm not that psychoanalytically informed. So if there's somebody else here who can round out this question, I would I would love to help. But the, um, I guess what I'm thinking is, you know, we do to we do have trouble tolerating feeling and even good feeling, right? So actually, we do sometimes tolerate good sex, not in the sense of that was great, I really tolerated it, but but in the sense of, um, you know, I'm thinking of the Leo Versace's formulation of when you can't tolerate the feeling anymore, that's when the ecstatic moment occurs and you lose yourself, your self disintegrates, right? And, and you no longer have a sexual orientation, you no longer have a gender identity, you no longer have any of those things, You're, you, you have no self, right? It, right? Because you couldn't tolerate the feeling anymore. Or I'm thinking of, you know, parents often say to their kids, you know, I love you so much, I want to eat you up, and, I, and, right? and I'm, I'm told by more psychoanalytically sophisticated people that that's a that's a devouring fantasy, right? That that's <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. And I, I love you so much I can't tolerate it. Right? I can't tolerate the feeling. I, I have to put you inside me and end the feeling because there's so much good feeling I can't I can't hold it. Right. And and so, you know, tolerance isn't always I, it's not always a negative. I mean I think in common parlance it is. But I, I do think there's another use of it or another concept of it that isn't so that, that's about how much feeling we can hold. And and I wonder if 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 we turned tolerance around like that a little bit and thought about, well, what if that's the kind of tolerance we were asking our allies for? You know, can you hold all your feeling? You know, can you do more with can, can you right? right? What? Well, it's such an interesting question. Um, you know, we've got devouring of Bersani. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, well, let me let me say this. I mean, I actually I don't I don't think that sort of frame of tolerance is what's active here. Um, now, it is not to say though that that possibilities of um, changes in affect to follow up to follow up on what you're talking about about affect can't occur in this context. I mean, I, I actually think in some ways it's it's a question we can't, as pessimistic as I am about some of this tolerance, you know, I think it's a question we can't know in advance to what extent, even something as, as much as I'm opposed, as you know, to sort of the obsession with gay marriage, I do think there's, there's something we can't know the answer to, which is to what extent the, you know, entry into that which you have been excluded from and the way in which that uh, you know, impacts potential others, those doing those tolerating, the way in which their affect may change about how they imagine um, relationships, sexuality, family. We can't know the answer to that. Um, you know, there might be a kind of tolerance uh, it, it, that can bloom into uh, celebration or bloom into a kind of affective embrace of difference. You know, I guess I'm, I, I, I find that the, the, the language of tolerance as yoked as it is in our moment to acceptance and to immutability as the way to get to tolerance, 
undermines that potential. For me, the immutability part really undermines it. That as long as we make the argument that, that, that you know, we understand tolerance to be granted because of this, ooh, can't help myself from queer kind of notion, um, that, it, that, the, that, the act, that it cuts off that kind of affect. It cuts off the potential for that affective register of change. Um, you know, but I do think you're on to something, and, and I often feel it, and I've written about it in terms of, of, of stuff with marriage, you know, that, that you know, as, as much as I find it loathsome, you know, on so many levels, um, personal and political, I, I also wonder, um, you know, when that begins to seep into our cultural waterways in certain ways, you know, when we drink the Kool-Aid of gay inclusion. Um, you know, does, does something affectively alter in, in those straight allies to which then tolerance becomes, you know, not an apt metaphor anymore, in which tolerance then becomes, they think, oh, actually, yes. I mean, I guess I would say I, part of what I would need to see is that, that, that questioning going on in allies, you know, about tolerance, um, uh, you know, that that is not what they keep arguing is the mode. Um, I don't know, does that answer some of what you're saying? I mean, I, I, I guess I'm more, I am more pessimistic about that, that potential for tolerance, because I don't think, I mean, I wish it was used more in a good old psychoanalytic devouring. This is too good, you know? Uh, this is just, this is, you know, queerness is so delicious, I just can't get enough of it, you know? <laughs> but I don't think that's the kind of tolerance that, I mean, I think that the tolerance is much more the kind of tolerance that, that Peter refers to, where, where tolerance has its other. You know, the tolerance of a certain kind of legitimate queerness does help to produce a kind of abjection of another form of queerness. You know, so, you call it people. <laughs> um, I'll try to start the trend of saying who you are, so Laura Green English, um, and that was Lydia Adler from the law school. Um, the, I guess I have a couple of, of comments or questions also, mostly directed at Susanna, um, just at one of them, which isn't meant to be quite as personal as it sounds, is that it does seem to me that a person who uses the word loathsome to describe her feelings toward others <laughs> might want to think about whether tolerance has its use. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're killing me! Which is... <laughs> Yes, point well made, my dear. Which is partly to say that, you know, I don't... Oh, you're so right. I'm I so think bad. none of us really want to be required to give up our strong feelings in order to behave civilly and on, on certain occasions. And this is where, I mean, I totally take Peter's point about the framing of laws having at least as much impact, if not more, if, as much impact as, if not more, impact than the actual laws themselves. But there is part of me that still clings to law as, I mean, I kind of believe in the rule of law because I don't want to have to rely on other people celebrating me in order for, you know, my personal safety and my um, ability to flourish and yeah so that's one thing but I also wanted to um, just suggest a little bit about the immutability argument that it might be useful to disaggregate it even further because it tends to get often collapsed especially in our current scientific climate with biological arguments and actually they're not the same thing right I mean it's perfectly possible to believe that queerness is immutable without believing that there's anything biological about it, whatever. You could believe that God made you immutably queer, or I mean, there's millions of ways to get there without biology. And similarly, it is perfectly possible to believe that there are biological markers for sexuality without believing that they're immutable, right? I can't remember what the, there's some scientific term for the, um, Mutual imbrication of environmental Epigenetic. and Epigenetic. 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 That's it. Thank you. But wait, wait, wait. I, I promise I'm going to stop very shortly. So um, it seems to me that, and it's also the case that some people really feel like their sexuality or some other aspect of their person is immutable, and some people really don't. And I honestly don't know 
how you would adjudicate which of those things is true, which is why I think the, you know, your most important, the point has got to be that it doesn't matter, right? But I think that it's, the more time we spend arguing kind of against immutability, the less time we're spending pounding home the point that it doesn't matter. We will never be able to prove either way anything about it. It completely fails the falsifiability test, and in the end, it doesn't matter. Huh. Um, well, where to start? Yes, you're right. Immutability, I mean, biological determinists and immutability are not necessarily the same thing, but I want to say a couple things about that. Number one, you know, the, the, the rise in theories uh, in contemporary theories of, um, you know, some sort of a biological or endocrinological or genetic basis for homosexuality, because no one cares about the straight sexuality, or homosexuality does coincide with the rise of the Human Genome Project and with the rise, I mean, so there's also a political and scientific, you know, with the rise of, you know, the, the attempt to find a genetic basis for everything, for intelligence, for shyness, for sexiness, for whatever it may be. Um, I would also say that it's vitally important to put these debates in a larger political context because, of course, the early gay movement was au contraire. I mean, what the early gay movement argued against was the medicalization of, of sexuality. And, uh, you know, the, one of the first real political moves was to get it removed from the DSM uh, and to demedicalize and to, you know, to refuse that, that argument. We, we really turned the clock back on that. Now, I would also say that you're absolutely right, that one of the tough issues with, immutability, with notions of immutability is that people experience it that way. But I would say two things about that. One, we need to disarticulate notions of determinism from something that's deeply felt. So part of, part of I mean, I, I think part of what we need to say is most people experience their sexual desires, not necessarily their identities, but their sexual desires or a sense of sexual selves as deeply felt. And to think, and, and not as a choice in the way, oh, I decided to wear this today, which is often how it is paired off, that either you're born that way in a predetermined biological way, or it's like a pair of shoes. Now, sometimes it is like a pair of shoes. It's like, oh, you look good. You know, I think I'll wear you today. I mean, that does sometimes happen for many of us. Um, but most people, most people, I would say, do experience their sexuality as something deeply felt. The way that gets collapsed into notions of predetermination is part of the problem. And most good scientists, by the way, would actually challenge that. But that's not the way it gets taken up in most popular discourse. It is immutability. I mean, the arguments that get taken up in popular discourse, and by the way, using legal arguments, used on all these marriage cases, is immutability as predetermination. Old, so, you know, old school biologically determinist, whether determined through genetics, whether determined through ed the endocrine system, you know, the fetal wash of endocrines, whether, I mean, there's many different ones, but they're all bad and they're all shoddy science. I mean, that's for sure. Um, so I do think we have to, uh, to challenge, I mean, I think there, there might be a way to talk about that notion of deeply felt. Um, and, and, and disarticulate that from notions of immutability. Because I don't, I, I don't agree that, I mean, I think immutability is a language that is tied up with a kind of predetermined biological argument. And I don't think we can separate that. I don't think, so I think we shouldn't engage in language of immutability. Could we engage in language of deeply felt? Yes. But in fact, you know, what's also true is that, you know, that, that notion, I mean, if we're going to be true social constructionists here, that very idea of deeply felt sexual identity, hello Foucault, I mean, you know, the notion of that we have a language to speak of this has to do with the way in which we've structured ideas about sexual identity, the relationship between acts and identities and so on. And it differs along gender hugely. When you do interviews, you know, the, the, bit, the, the little sort of research that's been done on this when people describe their experiences of sexual identity in that way, women will much more chart a notion of fluidity, of life course transitions, of changing, and men will talk about, I, you know, I always knew. Well, that accords with particular hegemonic ideologies we have about male sexuality. It's hard why, you know, in fact, I was on a panel once with one of the guys who is the, one of the big gene guys, Dean Hamer, um, who was panel mud bite 
call it what you will, um, <laughs> who's one of the sort of fathers of the gay gene stuff. And I'm arguing and arguing with him, and finally he says to me, well, Susanna, it's different for girls. <laughs> you know, now he said it in a, you know, off way. But, I mean, the, his idea was, actually, these immutability arguments speak to, you know, that hardwired, driven, I mean, think of all the kind, you know, male sexuality that just can't control itself. It just goes this way. It's just driven this way. And women are, you know, more fluid and less, you know, uh, predetermined that way. So it's... I, I don't think immutability is, is, a, is a phrase that we can recapture. I think we, we can use another language to talk about deeply felt, though. Does that answer so? Yeah. In the red scarf right here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. These are very interesting um, presentations. I was wondering if you could continue on the gender, both of you, the gender aspect of this. Um, uh, it seems to me that even in the presentation of the arguments for same-sex marriage, they became masculinized, like the idea, and racialized, the idea, and classified. <laughs> uh, the ideal same-sex married couple was two white middle-class men in the suburbs with, I mean, that, if you look at the media, it became much more that way as it became closer to the decision. And, and as I recall, one of Kennedy's questions in the argument uh, had to do with what about the children, the adopted children, and when he was talking about that, my sense was he was talking about, again, the adopted children of two men living in the suburbs. Uh, so that's one piece of it. The other piece, the gender aspect in terms of sexual molestation, as I understand it, most sexual molestation is actually heterosexual. It's uh, male on female. And is the kind of queering of the idea of sexual molestation a way to avoid dealing with the heterosexual, um, the questions of the overwhelming, overwhelmingly heterosexual nature and male nature of most sexual molestation? So, yeah, um, thank you for that. I think that um, people who criticize sex offender registry laws broadly um, would say that one issue with these laws is that they actually interfere with uh, prosecution, incarceration of people who actually pose the greatest kinds of threats in terms of sex offense. So. Um, uh, one reason for this is that uh, by kind of thinking of sex offense in terms of on like a sodomy level, like an unnatural, like heinous crime against nature that is, you know, anyone who does anything like this is this existential threat to their communities, their families, all this kind of thing. Um, it actually makes prosecutors much less willing to bring charges against certain kinds of sex criminals. Uh, so um, I was at a panel called uh, What's Queer About Sex Offenders? Uh, in Chicago several years ago, um, which was remarkable, probably obviously for a variety of reasons, but um, one of them was that uh, people shared the stage who had you know, really diametrically opposed goals. Uh, and so one moment of, in this was a feminist uh, lawyer who had been instrumental in um, uh, creating shifts in rape laws uh, to create like kind of different levels for rape. Um, which made prosecutors more willing to charge people with rape uh, and to seriously prosecute kind of those rape crimes. And the problem was is that, uh, you know, as, as this person put it, you know, you could imagine a prosecutor in a local community, uh, the rapist, the accused rapist is, you know, the quarterback of the football team, uh, and the prosecutor doesn't want to charge this person with a crime that's going to put them away for 20 years. So one of the solutions was to create different levels, right? That prosecutor might be willing to charge this person with the crime that's going to put them away for three years or nine years. So um, this person was arguing against sex offender registries, right, from radically different reasons than the uh, anti-incarceration activists also were arguing against sex offender registries. But they both didn't like them. And the reason why um, this person didn't like them was because now, once again, prosecutors are only willing to charge certain people uh, of severe sex crimes because if you get convicted of a crime, your life is wholly over, right, if you get convicted of a high enough level of a crime, which then um, the joke she made was that in Kansas there's a remarkable number of um, misdemeanor home invasions. 
right? So that's the kind of flip side of this. Uh, and so, so that is one gendered aspect, is that the, uh, there's only certain kinds of people who are prosecuted, right, and convicted of these crimes. The other aspect is that uh, it's absolutely the case that you know men who commit rape have a you know heterosexual men who commit rape in a heterosexual sense have massive amounts of privilege, right, and protections within the legal system. But once anybody has been convicted, and again, it's much less likely that a white heterosexual man who is convicted of like uh, what people, you, know, you might call acquaintance rape, right, uh, is actually going to be convicted than. Uh, a poor person of color, right, would be convicted of a similar crime. But once you get convicted, uh, then you are the kind of least privileged. Uh, and so that's another uh, sort of remarkable, uh, you know, uh, confluence, which is also extremely gendered. Uh, and one final thing I'll say is that um, something I didn't get to talk about here is there's a really fascinating um, body of literature on the sort of sovereign effect of prison bureaucracies, right, sort of prison procedures. Uh, and prison procedures, right, the way that, you know, kind of procedural rules are written for prisons um, is designed to use sex as punishment in a variety of ways. And one way that this happens implicitly is people that misbehave are put in cells with, like, known homosexuals, which means sex offender, right, someone who's been convicted of a sex crime, uh, so that that person, the idea is, will then be kind of raped as implicit punishments. Uh, and the response to this, of course, is these kind of rape, prison rape prevention acts, um, and the solution that they have is to ban all sexual activity between, you know, prisoners of any, you know, define all prisoners as they are as wards of the state, right, as kind of functionally children uh, in terms of, uh, you know, unable to provide any kind of consent. And so there's, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, thorny uh, issues, and I absolutely agree that uh, they're uh, extraordinarily gendered, uh, and, um, but also extraordinarily classed uh, and racialized. Hi, I'm Rachel Rosenblum from the law school. I just want to jump back in on the immutability question. Um, and just to, I, I teach immigration law, I want to throw out a perspective from asylum uh, law, which is a place where LGBT claims have been heard for many years, and it's not without its fault, and we'll be hearing, I think, this afternoon, some of the problems with that system, but it has contributed a different, um, there's, there's no, never really been a, a discussion within that body of law about the, the biological determinist questions that have kind of plagued the constitutional uh, cases. And uh, and what I think the main reason is that the definition of immutability is very different than for asylum law. Um, so I just want to throw it out there. The, def the definition is something that either can't be changed, I mean, that you have to have something that's immutable to be accounted in a particular social group for the purposes of asylum. But the definition of, of immutability is something that either can't be changed or is so fundamental that someone shouldn't have to change it. Uh, which gets to your, I think it gets to your deeply felt question. And the, the way that the uh, court arrived at that was to look at the four other, there's five grounds of asylum. A particular social group is the sort of open-ended one. The other is a race, religion, nationality, and political opinion. And so, and I think if you look at political opinion or, or particularly religion, I mean, it kind of gives you a way to not have to, on the one hand, have it not be on the one hand uh, biologically determined, or on the other hand, some, like what clothes you decide to wear right. that day, right? Because we all know, I mean, nobody argues that religion is biologically determined, uh, and it's clear you can change your religious beliefs, people convert all the time, but there is a widespread belief, you know, a value held in, uh, that, that nobody should be forced to change their religion. And it, in some ways, I think, answers this tolerance question, too, because it suggests uh, it does ask something. That is, it's, um, it's uh, you know, the, it, there's a value judgment there, right? It's kind of like substantive due process. Some things are, are going to be deemed fundamental and some things aren't. Uh, and, uh, and there's going to be conflict over what counts as fundamental. But if you're demanding that it be recognized as fundamental, it's sort of, you don't have to love us, but you but you have to recognize, you know, you have to accord this some... Um, some value in the same way you do to religion or, or something as a, and not see it as, you know, it's not just sort of something that you just have to put up with. Um, and so I just wanted to throw yeah, that Yeah, absolutely. Out. I mean, what's true is that, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the immutability argument that has become so dominant in, certainly in popular discourse around gay identity, but also in much of the legal discourse, not all of it, but in much of the legal, it didn't have to be that way. 
you know? And I mean, I think that's important. It wasn't the only route to take. I mean, the analogy with religion is actually a much more interesting one, and uh, I think a much more apt one, but the analogies have not been played out that way, by and large, in our public discourse. Um, they've been much more, the analogies have been played out much more around things that are considered outside of your control, right? Immu qualities of immutability that are not considered uh, about questions of volition or just so that the, the 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 opposition that's been set up has been has been one between a kind of notion of choice and volition and then we see this with reparative therapy and so on and a notion of absolute um, biological immutability and you know it, it, it didn't need to be set up that way legally and it didn't need to be that set set up that way ideologically and certainly is not the history of the way in which gay people have organized social movements. Uh, you know, that was, I mean, this is, a, a, in fact, a fairly recent um, interest uh, that has, that, that I think has, ha, has, has permeated much of um, sort of gay, you know, both gay and ally discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Back here. Um, just to follow up on that, uh, Fox and Ray with us, then, uh, um, to, you know, in a lot of ways, it seems to me that this sort of this idea that, um, uh, to be gay is, is somehow fundamentally immutable. It's really it's that sort of that shifted around the time that um, activists adopted the civil rights discourse, right? That this is who we are. This is you know there's nothing changeable. So it was a kind of a deliberate strategy that in a lot of ways worked as far as race is concerned. I mean that you know it has sort of its problems there too because of that sort of that fundamental tension between yes there is something immutable about race but on the other hand if you you know sort of critical scholars would argue well it is you know for it's generative it's culturally produced i mean there's nothing biological in that sense about race but it seems to me that it was really about following that path absolutely that helped sort of congeal that argument and i think what you're pointing to so well is sort of the tensions that that lays out mm -hmm. right repeatedly and the limitations um, that, you know, and I think this is where it also um, uh, interfaces with Peter's um, argument is about this kind of proliferation of laws, right? That somehow that, that system and the proliferation of laws is that which is going to actually, um, you know, sort of push that agenda forward. Um, and I think what you're more pointing to is the sort of the limitations of it. Absolutely, and I think, I mean, I think you're right in some ways it was a very deliberate strategy. I mean, I, I also think part of it, I, I, I think we can't, you know, sort of um, put put enough emphasis really on on what the Human Genome Project did in in the development of neuroscience and neuropsychology. You know, this, this sort of idea that we are all predetermined in this way. So I think it ha it seeps into the you know into the into the culture in a in a broader way as well. But you know, it certainly was a very deliberate strategy and and the, the strategy of analogy uh, in in challenging don't ask, don't tell in challenging gay marriage, you know, the, the sort of arguments about integration, about miscegenation, about the analogies with loving. I mean, those have gone on very deliberately. Um, and in fact, some of the people, you know, even some people who did testimony in some of the marriage cases and in some of the don't ask, don't tell, would say, you know, sort of on the side, yeah, I really use these immutability arguments. I hate them, I think they're wrong, but, but it worked. So there was a sort of strategic essentialism, I think, that went on uh, by folks who know better and who actually don't adopt that but found it a very useful rubric because as much as we've sort of deconstructed ideas of, of racial categories as you know sort of fictitious social constructions, certainly a, ge a general idea of those that permeates you know sort of cultural world is that these are predetermined. These are in a, these are there. These are real things. And if we can say we're a real thing too, and a, and a bounded thing. Uh, then we can access by analogy that process. Um, and so the choice not to sort of make the religion analogy more, for example, was it, it was it, it was a choice in some ways, a strategic, political, and legal choice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that um, I, the proliferation of laws point is a really good one because um, it speaks to the debate, the kind of social movement debate as to the viability and usefulness, tactical and strategic usefulness of appeals to the courts in general, right? So um, I kind of think of this as like three social movement options, right? One option is the state, which is broken into 
So that's two options, the courts or the legislature, right? And the other option is anti-statist, anti-establishmentarian, anarchist, uh, what have you, kind of social movement. Um, and uh, you know, there's a, a big body of literature and a variety of different disciplines that you know, calls into question the viability of using the courts to drive social change generally. Uh, but one, you know, kind of version of that is that if you're going to make an appeal, you know, in judicial, in the in the context of a judicial rhetorical situation, analogy is inevitable. Uh, as Haley argues, like race analogy is inevitable. It's impossible to escape them. Um, you could not make any of these analogies, or your lawyer couldn't, and the judge would, right? You know, kind of in responding to it. Uh, so, uh, and it's often what's necessary to, you know, kind of succeed and, and win a case. Um, so I think that uh, what that makes me think of, though, is that uh, it's also inevitable, I think, that people will continue to make appeals to the court. And so then uh, it behooves uh, at least some, you know, kind of scholarly attention to um, examples of kind of judicial rhetorical frameworks that do not require these kinds of arguments. Uh, one example of, the, of that is, I think, uh, the sort of Kennedy 14th Amendment, and it's not just Kennedy, but this kind of substantive 14th Amendment focus not on the nature and identity of the people who are uh, bringing claims uh, for protection before the law, but rather on uh, the, the entire focus and the burden is placed on the nature of the law itself, right? Uh, and so this is, you know, this kind of nominalist subject, this free subject. Uh, but that also has a, a, a huge variety of different problems. Uh, I mean, and kind of converse, right? You know, kind of abject results. Uh, and so I think it's just a, part of this is like a, a question of, uh, to use the war metaphor again, you know, like both tactical and strategic decision making on the part of social movement actors, but then a willingness to uh, be willing to confront the results of strategic essentialist decisions, right? Um, not just to sort of justify them, we had to do this, that's unfortunate, but to actually, you know, kind of continue to work in, in multiple other areas. Okay, we're going to take one more question and you've been waiting. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Karen Cardoso. Representing the Berkshires, came with the Mass College of Liberal Arts. One observation and two quick questions. The observation is something about how science is the controlling discourse of our time, right? So I feel like a lot of what's going on here is that we're, we're back in this, and we have a, a science expert in the back with Bonnie, so maybe she'd like to respond. But um, it's this rise of empiricism as the only way of knowing. And to me, that feels like a really big step back for what all of queer studies and feminism, obviously postmodernism, has been able to do. So that's just the observation. The, the two other things I was thinking as we were talking, one is if you could say a little about the trans movement, because I think there's another place where, at first, it looks like you're talking about gender fluidity and queerness, but I'm seeing more and more. It's it's also, it's the born this way discourse very powerfully that for a lot of people, you're just trying to fix, you know, and that's, that's legitimate, but I see a lot of people, I see how the discourse is becoming about getting your gender right, and I just wonder if you could say anything about that. In some cases, I've seen some really odd ways in which it's the way you structured the immutability discussion, I, that just kept coming up for me. Is it something going on there? with the trans movement that is also very slippery and potentially uh, dangerous. And the second thing that's kind of funny is just when you talk about how um, heteronormativity, it, you know, queerness is really an opportunity to look at what's wrong with marriage and heteronormativity. I'm thinking about Sheryl Sandberg's annoying lean in. Um, just for what, one of the things that came out of that was basically showing that one of the things holding back women's advancement is heteronormative marriage, right? The second shift, none of that has changed. And the place you look for workable alternatives is queer marriage and non-marriage and, you know, making up other ways of living that, that is not happening in heteronormative marriage. So that's a huge discourse out there about why can't women get ahead. You would think that there would be a link there to queering marriage and the rules of marriage. Yeah, <laughs> Ooh, uh, a lot there. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I mean, the question of how much marriage can be queered, uh, you know, is a question. I guess. I mean, you know, it's always about. I mean, how open we think institutions that have been built on the ownership of women and children can really get um, over time. I mean. 
you know, I'm kind of pessimistic, and I, I think we'll see. Frankly, I'm not sure how much straight people can learn from uh, queer marriages if queer marriages become like straight marriages, which they might very well. I mean, I think we don't know the answer to some of that. Um, I mean, but but certainly the the dis the dis I mean, I think you're right that the discourse is not, um, you know, let's get marriage right so we can mess with your heads big time, you know, and mess with marriage, which I wish it was. It's always this reassurance, you know, allow us into this institution, and it will not change yours at all. It will not alter you at all. And we at least have to pretend it will. You know, I mean, I think we at least have to say, oh, yeah, you should be scared. You should be really, really scared because it's going to make you very uncomfortable, you know. Um, but we don't say that. Um, I mean, the, 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 the question you have about immutability and, and trans, that's, a, that's a, a much bigger question. I would say I would put it in a somewhat different register, which is, which is the register of, of accessing medical care. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that... Um, to understand the relationship between biological discourses of identity and, and trans discourses, one always has to understand the ways in which people can access care and get medical coverage. So I think it is that overlays and both both overlays and undergirds any biological what we, what what might be determined a biological determinist kind of argument about um, about gender transitioning. So it's, it's the argument that has to be used in order to make. You know, so how much people really experience it as thus, you know, one can't know. So, we have time for one more question? Yeah, okay, we have time for one more question. <laughs> we do. Sure. This one right here. Uh, good morning. My name is Marcia cruz Reddy, and there's some things that I can't tolerate anymore. I'm enjoying this too much. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, there's things that I cannot change. For instance, when I start speaking, Everybody listen to a different sound that they say, oh, she's not from here. But if whatever I am, they are going to define for the color that they see in my whole, whole skin. Then that's the problem. How can I feel deeply? I, I love the concept of just feeling deeply what you are and showing it with all your strength, because that's what you are. And hanging on to the laws that exist there to protect what I am and use it against the right wings, the religious ones that want to undermine what I am. And how can I use that to survive and to, you know, flourish and bring other people like me together? For instance, the younger ones that yet don't know where they are, but they feel that they are not what they are. Then that's what I would like to know. How can I deeply feel it, but use the laws that are there and bring more laws to protect what I am? <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I, thank you very much for that. I, I think, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, part, part of the, the, the dilemma that we have with, with this, I mean, and, and Laura brought this up too about this notion of deeply felt, or is that we, um, it is hard to, to make that, the, that claim for rights on, based on this identity, this thing, without narrowing that thing, you know, and without putting boundaries around that, that thing, which often pushes, I mean, I think this is some of what, what you were gonna, which often then, pushes others outside of the realm of tolerance. Uh, I mean, that's some of the critique, for example, of, of some of the gay marriage movement, is that part of what it does is make, you know, it recognizes this thing um, and marks this thing of, of the one deserving of rights, deserving of those legal, of that legal recognition. And then others who, who, who experience this thing and live this thing in different ways become in some ways more outside of the realm of legitimate political discourse and protection. Um, you know, so that's, I mean, that's some of the dilemma, I think, of the current moment is precisely that. Is there something you want to add that? Or? Yeah, so I think I, think I have just a, a short and overly specific answer to your question, which is that um, I think I've become increasingly like radicalized and polemicized against any legal solution that includes incarceration or support for incarceration. So I'm really sympathetic 
uh, to the, I think, the truth that uh, a politics that simply like attempts to reject law, right, or work outside of law, um, is a deeply privileged and often racially privileged politics that ignores um, the necessity of laws and you know even police um, for protection of certain communities against you know kind of violent racists, for example, or uh, discrimination or you know other such things. But I think that when considering the viability of an existing law or a new law or support for something, hate crime legislation would be an example of this. Um, it's incumbent upon uh, activists who are interested in kind of intersectional solidarity, um, but particularly who are interested in racial justice and justice for poor people and justice for uh, trans and non cisgender people, uh, to you know kind of apply a test that asks first, you know, will this law, this new protection, um, does it rely on um, also a, a, a destruction of other protections, right? And so this is part of the trans. Um, argument against even the new version of ENDA. Uh, and second, um, will this law, this new protection, um, serve as a justifying um, and kind of aiding mechanism for the incarceration state that we live in? Uh, because if, if we continue to support laws that do that, um, then, I mean, I hesitate to make like root cause arguments, but I think I kind of am right now. I mean, we live, I mean, it's, we live in a state of like reproduced slavery by incarceration. And so, that's, I think it depends on the kind of law, but those increasingly, I'm sympathetic to those, those two kinds of tests. Um, and someone who's been really inspirational, like their work um, to me is Dean Spade uh, and the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, who I think do a wonderful job of articulating anarchist kind of critiques of law and positions around law that are not like privilegedly anti-legal. Uh, so, so that would be a suggestion. I think that's a good place to end. So let's thank the panelists.